All right, and our next uh, environment are seagrass beds. We talked um, a little bit ago about uh, critters needing to hide. Um, seagrass beds are an amazing place for that. Uh, you see these all along the shorelines. Um, again, I, I always refer to the East Coast. I've, I've not seen the West Coast yet. Um, in my mind, the West Coast is is different. It's rockier. It's uh, uh, I always picture a lot more cliffs and so on and so forth. I picture a different shoreline. I'm sure they have uh, some areas that are very similar to what we see on the on the East Coast. Um, but uh, so we're going to say these seagrass beds are, are all along. On both coasts with regard to America. There are other places in the world, but this is one of those Americano-centric uh, lectures. Um, so seagrass is amazing stuff. It uh, it not only provides uh, a breeding ground, a hiding ground for little critters, it, it provides a, a food source. I mentioned uh, chincoteague um, in the previous slide, and um, the ponies that live there and they are very special little ponies indeed who uh, evolved to be able to tolerate the eating this salty salty grass and one of the things that they're known for are their silly little pot bellies they have those silly little pot bellies because they're retaining so much water from such a salty diet um but uh you know there's there's many other other critters that eat these too um Seagrass is uh, actually just like, you know, grass in your front yard in that it reacts to fertilizer and um, whatnot. And it, it's, you know, Mother Nature likes to keep a balance, okay? And one of the things I remember early on back when I still got to go to conferences and, and whatnot was um, conversation about the Chesapeake Bay and how the farms in New York State, their fertilizers were running into the rivers, which were running down into, uh, dumping out in the Chesapeake, and the seagrass was going wild, all the fertilizer, right? And um, what was happening is, well, what's Maryland known for? Any of you? Okay. Crab cakes, crab, Maryland blue crab. All right, and what was happening is the seagrass was growing so much that it was actually affecting the crab population. Uh, it was too dense for them to move around. Uh, more than likely, they just moved farther out, but when you move further out, you've got more issues. So um, I, I don't know where they ever got it, but I, I still remember the, uh, the speaker that I was listening to, and I, I didn't live in New York State at the time. He said, you know, it's really hard to convince a, a farmer in, in New York State that his cow's poop is is affecting the, the water in the Chesapeake Bay, but it does, it is, and so on and so forth. So I, I hope they worked it out. Uh, I do love my Maryland blue crab. Um, but uh, again, just a, another example of how everything is uh, connected. So the seagrass beds. A little clicky as a parking here. There we go. Kelp forests. All right. These are, um, I always picture West Coast. I was just talking to you about differences between East Coast and West Coast. All right. We've got a lot of seagrass. They've got the kelp forests. And uh, the idea of using the word forest here is to make you think, of course, more like trees than a field, right? um 200 feet high okay and it's it's really brown algae um it is photosynthetic and look at those i encourage you to google some other pictures this is just one that i found a ways back but you see the kelp plants where's my mouse there's my mouse you see the kelp plants growing up this side here you see some in the background really gives you that sort of fish tank look, doesn't it? That, of course, is probably a full-sized shark, uh, to lend you some scale here. Um, tube worms, sponges, uh, otters, sea crabs, you, you name it, okay? Um, they all live in and around uh, this 
this forest. There's a picture, and I wasn't able to find it, uh, of a of an otter hanging it out. Maybe it was a video, I guess, hanging out, uh, floating around on one of the uh, kind of like a frog on a lily pad. All right, but this otter uh, playing on these uh, kelp leaves up near the surface and just kind of lounging on them, catching some sun. Very cute stuff. Kind of like kitten videos, but uh, for marine biologists. Uh, interesting to note, they typically, this isn't eaten. Okay, it's more of a living in the environment. I'm sure there's some critters that go up and down and eat it or something that grows on the kelp itself. Uh, you might get secondary algae growth and so on and so forth that the critters will scrape off but um i guess the kelp itself is is typically not eaten and you could probably imagine some finding nemo moments in here of sharks chasing little fishes through the forest there it really is its own little ecosystem and we haven't really used that word we save the word ecosystem um much more for like environmental science class right uh, but um it's certainly no harm in pointing out that we're we're talking about ecosystems here be it the the salt marsh or the estuary or the kelp forest or I think where we're headed next, the coral reef. Yeah, coral reefs. All right, so these are all little ecosystems. So everybody's favorite. I was just talking about Finding Nemo. I think that took place in a coral reef. Um, my kids don't really dig Disney movies, so I'm, I'm sure I've seen Nemo, at least most of it, but uh, one of the few people left on the planet there. Um so coral reefs, they're beautiful, right? And uh, if you, uh, we were talking about a fish tanks the other uh, couple slides back, um, that's sort of like the golden uh, golden level of fish tank ownership is if you could manage a salt tank, right? And you've got the cool little sea anemones and maybe a live coral or two in there. Um, it's, it's a neat little world uh, on a coral reef. And corals themselves, um, being a, a historical geologist myself, I, I do fossils and stuff like that, is my actual gig. Um, the corals are neat little animals, uh, critters. They're, the coral that you know of, a picture of the white branching stuff, you may have seen it at a, a pet store or a gift shop or whatever. That's kind of like a condominium. Okay, if you've got a piece somewhere in your house, go look at it when you're done. There's little circles up and down those those twigs. And in each one of those little circles, you might have an asterisk on it or something like that. Um, each one of those little circles housed a coralite, a little coral animal. And it looks kind of like a hydra, okay? Uh, kind of like a little sea anemone critter. And it goes in and out of those holes. It's, it's communal living. It's a neat, uh, neat little idea. Anyhow, uh, coral comes in all shapes and sizes, not just those twigs. Um, it's made out of calcium carbonate, which is limestone. Okay, we don't talk a whole lot about rocks in earth science class, but uh, limestone is just about everywhere on the planet. Limestone only forms in oceans, and one of the biggest sources for the lime, the calcite in the limestone, um, are these old coral reefs. Um, Florida, for example, okay, is basically just uh, coral reef after coral reef after coral reef sutured together over the years. Um, Limestone dissolving the reef, redepositing it as rock. I'm sorry, limestone that formed from the reefs dissolving and being redeposited as as rock. Um, the thing about coral reefs, uh, you've also probably heard they're very touchy, very delicate environments. Okay, um, it is a, a living crust on it, and um, only the very outer edge of that. Okay, the crust, the frosting, the icing, whatever you want to call it is is alive okay and they build right on top of the old community uh, oftentimes you know choking it off while doing so uh, it's got to be in the photic zone which means um where light can get down to it okay oftentimes these are photosynthetic uh, environments or at least you know a good chunk of it is photosynthetic and um they're also known for being you know inc incredibly brightly colored this one isn't necessarily highlighting that, but I, I got it for the for the diversity of the organisms in the picture. Um, the colors from coral reefs come from all of the different algae and, and bacterium that are growing uh, in and around these these organisms, and in addition to the organisms themselves. Um, one of the worst things you can see is is a coral reef 
that is all just a, a whitish gray. That means it's definitely um, dying out. The water is bad. These are very temperature uh, resist, uh, not resistant, uh, temper, temperature affected by. <laughs> not the best wording, but you know what I mean. Um, if the water gets too too warm, too cold, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it can affect the the uh, algae and bacteria first. Okay, and what happens is that works its way up up the food chain some more environmental science for you there sorry but um it works its way up the food chain and the the things that eat the things that eat the things you know it all collapses if you lose you lose that base of the food chain so um very special things and of course because they're shallow and because they tend to form um uh, very close to shore okay that means if it's a uh, we've got people banging around usually. Uh, if you're ever lucky enough to go somewhere and they allow you to uh, snorkel around their coral reefs, uh, please listen to their rules and, and don't step on, don't touch. Um, not only can it be sharp, but this is a very fragile environment and, uh, you know, you do your part to help keep it alive. So, anywho, coral reef. Um... There are three varieties of coral reefs that we're going to talk about. All right, these are just some common ones. And uh, atoll, you may have heard of. Barrier reef, you may have heard of. Fringing reef, probably not. So the barrier reef is uh, basically you're going to have a back lagoon. A lagoon is a uh, small sheltered body of water. Okay. And um, you see it in the atoll as well. Uh, it's not entirely isolated. It can break through and critters can get back and forth. But it's mostly, you know, sort of a, a well, barrier to use part of the word from there. You know, it's not impenetrable. There's, there's holes in the reef. There's uh, oftentimes it's not solid wall all the way across. And that goes the same way for the, the atoll. Okay. Um, the fringing reef is, uh, I guess, I don't know. I don't know enough about them to say if whether or not it's a it's an evolutionary stage of reef building. Uh, I could very easily see um, a fringing reef growing into a barrier reef, if you follow me. Uh, or maybe uh, a barrier reef growing into a fringing reef. Okay. Uh, you could view it as um, the the reef hasn't built itself up high enough yet to be a barrier. Or the old barrier reef has died off, like we talked about, and the, the constant battering of the waves has uh, has worn it down over time. And your book might even go into more details on that and prove me entirely wrong or right or, or half right or half wrong for that matter. But um, from memory at any rate, um, and just by looking at it, they, they do look kind of uh, related. Atolls, though, are very cool, especially to see from, from above because of the cool little circle. And usually a uh, they've got a reef in the center as well. They just look neat. So we're shifting gears here. Um, and we have been talking about some ecology words, some environmental words. We talked about ecosystems a little while ago. Now we're going to use another word, niche, okay, or niche. As some people like to say, I'm a niche kind of guy, though. Um, these are sort of roles you play in your environment. That's what a niche is, where you are, where you live, what you do. It, it's all kind of wrapped into one big word there. Um, so we're going to talk about three different lifestyles, okay, um, that there are in the oceans. They are plankton, nectin, and benthic, benthos. You'll hear me say benthic, okay, as well. Uh, plankton, nectin, and benthos. Hey, there's everybody's buddy. Uh, plankton, okay. Plankton are floaters. Some can swim a little bit, okay, but typically uh, they are floaters. And that allows them the ability to migrate vertically 
uh, in the water column, all right, uh, for feeding. And you're like, wait a minute, plankton eats? Well, yeah, he is always trying to eat Krabby Patties, of course, but um, that's not entirely what we mean. Um, we've got, as you see here, there's two types of plankton. You've got phytoplankton and zooplankton. So the ends of both of those words are similar. The beginnings are different. Uh, any idea what phyto or zoo means or zo? Well, we've got a zo here in Utica. All right. And what's at the zo or animals, critters, right? So zooplankton are teeny tiny animals, which means that phyto, okay, and not phyto the dog, F I D O, but phyto, that's plants. So you got two types of plankton. You've got plankton that are plants, or very similar to plants, and then you've got your, your zooplankton. And some folks, when you took biology class, if you took a biology class, you might have even heard the word planimals. Okay, uh, there's some there's some pretty weird stuff out there. These these guys that aren't quite alive, aren't quite plants. Um, it gets it gets interesting. We're keeping it simple here though, and talk about the phytoplankton and the zooplankton. So, phytoplankton um, tend to be photosynthetic. You've heard that word a couple times. Hopefully you know what it means. I apologize for not uh, describing it earlier. But uh, photosynthesis, you, you probably remember, um, not the equation perhaps, but uh, as what uh, plants do, green plants in particular, chlorophyll. Remember all that? Okay. So we've got algae and cyanobacteria. Cyan is a color, bluish green, and these are also sometimes called the the uh, blue green bacteria. They used to be, if you're old like me, uh, you possibly heard these called blue green algae back in the day. Um, they're not algae; they figured that out a couple decades ago. Believe it or not, uh, it's still floating around. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, they're still out there. Uh, a lot of people out there who still call them cyanoalgae. Or blue green algae, not really cyanoalgae, but blue green algae. Um, but most folks now are, are, you know, trying to push the cyanobacteria. Maybe that's why they dropped the uh, the blue green, just to completely, you know, give you a name shift there. Anyhow, so different types of algae can be photosynthetic. Uh, they have chlorophyll embedded in them, chloroplasts technically. Um, I remember your organelles, right? And then uh, same thing with cyanobacteria. Um, they can, uh, they've got a neat little symbiosis going on and uh, where we've got chloroplasts embedded in the bacteria. So that's phytoplankton. And they, of course, um, don't really think. Okay, we don't talk too much about plants thinking. Some of you might argue with me and, and I always enjoy those conversations. Um, they say plants enjoy music and so on and so forth. Who's to say plants don't think? But um, they probably don't say, oh, it's time to go up and get some sunlight. All right. At least consciously, they I don't think they do that. Um, but they do rely on being uh, in the sunlight zone. Okay. What we referred to as the photic zone earlier uh, in order for that photosynthesis to happen. Now, guess who comes to eat the phytoplankton? Okay. Exactly. The zooplankton. Um, and the zooplankton... Those are your active hunters, if you would. Okay, they're coming up in the water column. Um, these are the guys that are swimming along. All right, and they're coming up to feed. Now, they don't want to stay up there all the time because guess who else is up there? The fish, right? So they come up. Um, and I've actually, I'm trying to, it's been a long time since I've uh, studied and or read about this stuff, but... Um, I, I want to remember one of my, I want to say I recall one of my teachers saying that uh, the zooplankton actually came up at uh, night when, I don't want to say the fish were asleep, but, um, you know, obviously it was much less activity, okay, uh, in the uh, in the water column. So the phytoplankton are up there, you know, mostly all the time, um, absorbing sunlight during the day. And then the zooplankton come up when the fish are uh, less active, and, uh, yeah. And then, of course, you can take this to um, not even just deep water, where I've kind of been explaining it to you, where they're migrating up and down in the water column. But you can think about this in one of the um, 
closer to shoreline environments that we just talked about, okay, um, where you've got the zooplankton zooming in and out of um, the rocks and the, the sea grasses and, and whatnot. So this can happen um, horizontally, if you would, um, close to shore or, or near shore, okay, where these plankton live. And we talked about this. All right, you read it? Okay, now the nectin. The nectin are swimmers. And not just like the, okay, let's paddle up and go eat that phytoplankton kind of swimming, but like the actual swimming. Your fishes, your turtles, your whales, and everything else that I haven't mentioned that you know actively swims, okay? Um, that is a lifestyle. Again, we've got uh, critters that live close to shore and offshore. You're a lot more familiar with these, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them. I guess I could have put some pictures in here, though. Maybe I'll do that before I post the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, the benthos, the bottom dwellers. Again, you're familiar with these guys, but you're probably not familiar with the word benthos or benthic. Okay. Um, You've got three types of bottom dwellers here. And you know what? I'm going to make these bold for you. So you see it better. This is sort of a fresh PowerPoint. As you see, it's called new. It was an old PowerPoint, but I completely reworked it. Why is that not as bold? Eh, I guess it's sort of bold. Is this different font? Calibri body. Calibri light. Ooh, yuck. Why is that light? There we go. Oh, geez. I got to go do that to 40 slides now. Ugh. Okay. But that needs to be fixed. I like that better. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. So, three types of benthic uh, organisms. Three ways to live as a benthic organism. Three types of benthos. Fixed or attached burrowers and the walkers or crawlers. Okay. So fixed. These guys are attached to the ocean floor or just, let's just say rocks. Okay. Um, I mentioned the little clams that, that burrow down in, uh, back and forth. Okay. Um, uh, those are not the same as oysters. All right. That's one big difference. Oysters are attached to rocks as are uh, mussels, I think, as well. Um, barnacles. Barnacles are very cool um, critters. They're very strange critters. They're actually crustaceans. They're related to crabs. Uh, but they have a hard shell that kind of looks like a tooth or a little volcano, if you would. Uh, and they use it for protection. I think it even has a little lid on it, too. Um, and they they could, they could come out and... Uh, and uh, eat when they need to, and then they could go back in and, and hide. Now that I say that, I'm wondering if they're not bivalves. So crustaceans, they look like little crabs, but they live in a hard shell. Eh, I'll have to check that one. Sponges. Sponges are very cool. Um, when Unfortunately, when people think of sponges, they tend to think of the, the loofah sponge in their shower, or at least uh, maybe when you were growing up in your parents' shower. Loofah sponge, believe it or not, is actually a gourd. It's not a critter at all. And some of you just did two woes there, because first of all, the sponge is a gourd. That's kind of weird. And then to call a sponge a critter, sponges are alive. They are animals. Um, <laughs> we were just talking about plants thinking. Um, yeah, yeah, it's tough to figure out where, you know, sentience in a sponge would be. Um, but that's not necessarily a requirement for life, okay? Uh, or again, at least a sentience that we could measure or communicate with. Um, sponges are animals, okay? They're phylum periphera. Um, so, yeah, sponges. But they are fixed. They, uh, sponge divers go down with sharp knives, uh, just like the oysterers and so on and so forth. And they have actually cut these sponges off of the rocks where they grow and they bring them up to dry them out. 
Um, so fixed living. And that, of course, protects you. We talked about how uh, rough it can be living in the uh, water, especially near shore. Uh, having a fixed existence onto a rock provides you uh, some protection from, from battering back and forth in the waves. Okay. Uh, the burrowers. The bur burrowers uh, burrow for a couple reasons. Uh, one, to, to be able to relax for a little bit. Um, especially if you're not on the shoreline where the water is constantly going back and forth. We mentioned the poor clams struggling. Uh, but if you're out a little farther where you're constantly covered uh, by water, if you go down deep enough, you know, you should be able to, to, to not worry about being uncovered for a little while. And then in that case, you only come up to eat. Okay. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty smart lifestyle there to be a burrower, uh, in the offshore world. Uh, walkers. These are your starfish, your crayfish, um, and, and a handful, you know, your crabs, all those guys. Um, Again, they're in a, in a near shore environment as well. Um, oftentimes you go, you know, get farther off for the bigger critters. Um, but, uh, we see them both on the tidal pools and out in the, the deeper water. Your lobster fishermen, for example, go, you know, good bit out. These are your, you know, you could think of this with, with food chain, uh, to land animals that you may are, you know, familiar with, but, uh, these are your your hunters, if you would. Starfish are amazing organisms. Um, instead of muscles, they have a, a hydrovascular system. Um, water pressure, okay, in these tubes that run through their bodies. And by, uh, you, you might be familiar that they have these little tube feet, okay, these little suction cup thingies. And by shooting water in and out of those, they move their uh, arms Okay. And, uh, they can crawl in that manner and they're incredibly strong. They, their, their arms, they can pry apart, um, clams and whatnot. And, uh, definitely, you know, shellfish, shellfish are nothing for them, but probably much harder to catch. Um, but, uh, and then they've got the vicious, vicious mouths. They've got a little beak in the center. Again, stuff you don't typically get to see by the time they get to the gift shop, but, um, Starfish are really amazing critters. And they also, you know, they're known for their regeneration, which is cool too. So, anywho, I had a friend in college who studied uh, starfish. I thought they were quite neat indeed. All right, changing gears again. And lo and behold, I managed to take uh, just about 15 minutes to talk about lifestyles in the ocean. So we'll stop the video here again.